welcome. We're glad you joined us for another service at the Potter's House. We pray that God would speak to you and give you a revelation for your life. You live the life. have your Bible, turn to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel 15, beginning at verses 32 through 33. And I just want to pray real quick before we begin. Preaching a sermon entitled Standing Against Barrenness. Barrenness is a spirit, and so I feel it's necessary that we pray briefly and just, just come against the spirit of barrenness and doubt before we get into the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus. God, I'm asking you, Lord, that you would cast down unbelief, God, and doubt by the blood of Jesus Christ, God. God, that you would equip us, God, to be the men and women that you called us to be. God, I rebuke and ask you to bind up unbelief and release faith and expectancy, God. I bind barrenness and the spirit of barrenness, and I release and speak fruit and fruit that would remain over this congregation, God. Every congregation uh, that is here represented this evening, God. Every life, God, calls us to have a divine effectiveness in this arena of fruitfulness, God. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. By way of illustration, um, Ashley and I, my wife, when we were pastoring in Denver, Colorado, it was in 2018, we uh, found out we were, she was pregnant, and then we went to the hospital, she began to experience some pain, so we go to the doctor's office at first, and they're like, there's uh, some problems, and we're like, okay. Well, come to find out she uh, had an ectopic pregnancy. So what we had to do is go spend Halloween night in the hospital going through that whole process, which is a very long and difficult process to go through. We end up going back home for some time out of the ministry. We call it redirection in our fellowship back to our home church in Prescott, Arizona. Ashley gets pregnant again, and she began to feel these same pains. I didn't know this. She didn't tell me that she was feeling the same pain. She went to Pastor Greg. We went together to our pastor. God prayed for, and the pain immediately left. And then we went to the doctor again. We had to go early because of the history. And the ultrasound revealed not only one, but two babies. You see, Ashley could have just said, It's just another ectopic pregnancy. This is just what it is. The doctors had said it's going to be difficult to reproduce. You're not going to have children as easily, yada, yada, yada. But she said, no, let's go get prayed for because this is not acceptable. In salvation, when we are not experiencing fruit, We need to also have an approach that says we are going to pray and not accept the circumstance. In our scripture, though, Saul, King Saul, he actually allowed an individual named Agag to remain alive after God said to destroy and kill him. God said this man is not good, kill him. Why? Because this man had actually attacked multiplication and fruitfulness for the children of God. But Samuel, the prophet on the other hand, judged wickedness. He judged barrenness. And in our lives, we also must judge this demonic spirit of barrenness. Just two very short pieces of scripture. 1 Samuel 15, beginning at verse 32. Then Samuel said, bring Agag, the king of the Amalekites, here to me. So Agag uh, Agag came to him cautiously and said, surely bitterness, the bitterness of death is past. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, 
so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal. That's pretty heavy, right? But he said, we're not going to put up with this anymore. Standing against barrenness. Let's look firstly at this, this, the Agag spirit. Because we have to understand our text, it brings up a condition that we would call barrenness. Verse 33, but Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be. So spiritually speaking, this has to do with a failure to produce conversions. Genesis 1, 28, then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. So God's design for you and I, the church, is to reproduce. God's design from the very beginning is that very thing. For us to replicate and produce and reproduce who we are. You know, there's actually an attack on reproduction. Right? In a natural sense. But I want to tell you tonight, if you're a bear, you're going to make a bear. Apples make apples. And if you're a boy, you're a boy. You're a girl, you're a girl. You see, and Christians... We are to reproduce Christians. And there are people that are not experiencing this. Rather, they're they're experiencing spiritual childlessness. You see, the root cause of this barrenness is actually a demonic spirit. Verse 33 of our scripture, As your sword has made women childless. You see, many people, especially when we're in ministry, we try to make this a natural problem. It's the city, it's our street we're on, it's my personality, it's the location, it's my looks, etc. But many fail to make the connection that this is spiritual. And we need to make the connection that spiritual barrenness is always going to require a spiritual solution. Spiritual problems require spiritual solutions because barrenness has spiritual roots. There are some that barrenness has actually become a settled condition. You see, Agag had been doing this for years, for generations. He was brutal. These people were brutal. And they left women barren for generations. And I understand that there are seasons of fruitfulness. There are seasons of barrenness. This is how it is. We go through these ups and downs, these, these you know, ebbs and flows in life. But some, a season has turned into an eternal longstanding You see, how could this be if God's intention and plan for our lives is fruitfulness? So how can there be a born-again believer that is settled with barrenness when God has given us a command to be fruitful and multiply? There's a story in 1936, Japan signed what they called the uh, anti-comintern pact with Germany and later with Italy. And this was replaced with the tripartite pact in September of 1940, which recognized Japan as the leader of the new order in Asia. So Japan, Germany, and Italy agreed to assist each other if they were attacked by any additional power not yet at war with them. Then we understand later on, on August 6, 1945, then August 9, 1945, Hiroshima and Nagasaki were obliterated because of the attack on Pearl Harbor, but this attack stemmed from their peace agreement with the wrong nations. So because they made peace with the wrong people, these cities were completely obliterated. And if we're not careful in salvation, we can make peace with the enemy of our soul. We can make peace with barrenness and say it just is what it is. But that's wrong. So let's look secondly at peace with Agag because there are some that have actually made made peace with the Agag spirit. 
If we think about the background of our text, 1 Samuel 15, uh, 8 and 9 says, He also took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lamb, and all that was good, and were unwilling to utterly destroy them. He made peace with Agag, but everything despised and worthless they destroyed. So there's some here tonight that you are cohabitating, you're coexisting with the spirit of barrenness. You're saved, but this spirit is alive in your life. And like Saul, you failed to bring judgment on this spirit. You're involved, you're doing things in the will of God, in our churches, doing what we do, but it's been okay to be barren. So the question I have, is barrenness okay with you and where you're at in your life? Do you know people that are unsaved that have not been brought into the kingdom of God, that are dying and going to hell? Listen to me, we are in the last days. We live in a crazy world. It doesn't matter if you're in a little podunk town in the Southwest uh, or you're in this little place called Brooklyn, New York, right? There are people that are dying and going to hell. And we have to ask ourselves, are we okay with that? And if we're okay with barrenness, why is that okay in life? Have you recognized that you're comfortable with being barren? And how long have we allowed this to take place in our lives or in our ministries? You see, but the truth of the matter is, is this spirit and the strategy of this spirit is peace. Verse 32, then Samuel said, bring Agag, the king of the Amalekites here to me. So Agag came to him cautiously and says, surely bitterness has, the, the bitterness of death has passed. So here he is. I can picture this. I picture the boss, right? And then here comes in some little minion and he's all scared. He's like, bro, 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 bro chill, 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 chill. Let's talk about this. Let's talk about this. What do you need, right? He's trying to make peace. Surely there's got to be another way. Don't kill me. We can work this out. You see, what felt like peace in a moment wasn't peace at all. See, right now, it's peace in your life with barrenness, but in time, it could be the end of church. It could be the end of our fellowship. It could be the end of salvation for many people because this is what the enemy wants. You see, the end game for the enemy of our souls is barrenness. And the way he gets uh, to this point is it's actually through us. This spirit of barrenness, this agag spirit, it wants to be left alone. So how does this spirit get us to make a treaty with it? Number one, it promises comfort and security. You see, Saul could have saw some financial benefit in this. Think, think about it. He says, everything that was not useful to them, he destroys. But then everything that was useful, he says, I'm keeping this. Sometimes, you know, it could have been that it was financial benefit for Saul. It could have been lucrative when you were capturing a king and his kingdom. You see, it's not enough that Religious people come to church, we want and we want to see conversions and supernatural fruitfulness. We can't fall into the trap that just because they give, that it's conversions. Listen, this is something that happens in every church. I've experienced it in every place that I've been. The second thing is it promises an easy way to fruitfulness. Agag saying, again, there has to be an easier way to do this, Samuel. Sam, Sammy, come on, bro. Let's chill. Let's talk. Sit down. Have a cup of coffee. It promises an easy way. Agag says there has to be. And sometimes we can even feel that way. You know, I was talking to a guy earlier, uh, Pastor Matt and I, we were out and, you know, we were actually at Starbucks and this guy, he's actually, he owns a pretty successful marketing company and he's a marketing company for churches. And, you know, and he's like, he's a flyer. Pastor Matt gives him a flyer. He's like, oh, are you the pastor? Pastor, hey, he's talking to him. And 
He's like, well, I can get you Google ads. I can get you a million hits. We send out a million invitations every month. And that's, there's validity to that. We, Prescott does it. We market online. We have social media and things like that. I get that. But sometimes we have this thought in our mind, there has to be a better way than this whole evangelism thing. You see, you cannot combat this spirit by making peace with it. You cannot combat this spirit uh, without fighting. Some Christians even choose to pull away from the truth. Some become obsessed with being socially acceptable. You see, the problem with making peace with Agag is that he wasn't telling the truth. He wasn't being honest. It's not like he changed his mind about what he wanted to do. And the fact of the matter is, is that the enemy will never play fair or stop his scheming even when he's begging for his life. And what's crazy about this is it was in his DNA. Because Haman was actually a descendant of Agag. Haman plotted to destroy the people of God. And so it never changed. Even after he died, his descendants had the same thing inside of them. And this is a great picture. And this is why I say it's a spirit. Because it's never changed. And this spirit is aggressively attacking God's people and God's church. And it wants to be aggressive and seek progression in our lives. And if we allow it to exist, it will plot just like Agag and Haman to destroy God's people. On an individual basis, uh, on a corporate level, uh, and in our and many fellowships, think about this. There was a saying that used to be alive. It said the only people out when it was raining were the crows, the Methodists, and the homeless. When's the last time you've seen Methodists knocking on doors? And I'm not knocking them. There's people there that are saved. But listen to me. If we ever stop getting the vision for going out and evangelizing and telling people about Jesus Christ, we'll be another has-been that could have been and didn't. You see, a lack of fruitfulness is one of the most spiritually unhealthy things that you and I can ever experience long term. But on the other hand, being spiritually fruitful is one of the healthiest things that can take place in your spiritual life. You see, if you live and you make peace with spiritual barrenness, it's going to snuff you out over time. If you stay dormant, and that's possible, it's hard to maintain over time. You see, we must have a posture... And a heart attitude that says, I will accept nothing less than fruitfulness for my life, for my church, for my family, for my ministry. You see, when we were in Prescott, we had our first set of twins, and then we found out we were having our second set of twins. And when Pastor Matt got announced to come here, I remember talking to Pastor Jesse. I said, there's only one person that's going to be preaching in our concerts now. Like, how can I help? Can I, am I allowed to? Am I, you know, I'll help. Whatever you need me to do to start preaching and stepping up and standing in the gap. And so I started preaching at 180, our concert scene and stuff again. And but then I was like, you know what? This isn't enough. God, I'm not going to preach unless you get people saved. I'd rather just sit on my butt at home if people aren't going to be saved. And then people started getting saved. I said, God, they're not coming to church. It's not good enough that people get saved and they're not coming to church. So I remember laying it out before God. I'm in prayer. We have our second set on the way. And I said, God, if you can make us fruitful in the natural. After we had this ectopic, they said, it's going to be very hard to get pregnant again. If you can make us fruitful in the natural, then you can make us fruitful in the spiritual realm. I want fruit in this church because of our lives. And I'm telling you, when I laid it out before God and I said, God, give me fruit lest I die. And I, and I literally said this. I said, God, if you're not going to make me effective and fruitful in this congregation, 
then call me to something else. I am not going to go out and preach again unless you make me fruitful. And I'm telling you, God did something. God honored that heart that said, I'll accept nothing less. And I, I wanted to give Pastor Matt a, a picture, and I totally spaced it. But there's, this, in the church now, a man named Stephen Underwood. His wife, you know, she's kind of in and out. But Stephen Underwood, man, I, a lot of work went into this young man. But he's living for God. He's still saved, still in the church. His kids are still in the church. Another guy named Joseph Lopez. I ran into him on outreach, didn't come, went to jail. He got out of jail, got a wreck, totaled his car, was drunk. He's on the bus from the jail back to Prescott, and God tells him, you need to find Nate Rush's number. He finds my number. He had deleted it. He had blocked me because I was texting him like, yo, come to this event. He's still saved. He's back in Riverside, California. Last I heard, he was in one of our fellowship churches. He sent me a video of him street preaching by himself in a shopping center, praying for people. Listen to me. You want fruit? You got to fight for it, but you got to say, God, I'll accept nothing less than supernatural impact. So let's look at the sword of fruitfulness because barrenness, it must be judged. Verse 33, Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hacked Agag in pieces before the Lord. You see, Saul wanted to be friends with Agag, and Samuel said, absolutely not. I am not going to put up with this anymore. You see, we have to judge the spirit in our lives, in our churches, in our families. But nobody can do it for you except for you getting honest before God and laying hold of it. And if you want this curse of barrenness to be broken, then you must do what Samuel did and judge it. Tear it down. This is an attitude and you have to say, barrenness, you spirit of barrenness uh, and unbelief, uh, I will not cohabitate with you anymore. This is unacceptable in my life, in my church, uh, that when people walk through this door and they step over that threshold, uh, that there will be a sense of purpose, uh, of destiny, and of calling, and that God would draw in converts and couples uh, that would one day be raised up and sent out of Fort Myers, Florida. I'm telling you, if you judge it with an aggressive heart, God will do it. God will begin to add to your church, add to your life, tear down the strongholds and the curses in your family of those that you've been witnessing to, those that you've been crying out to God for. Say, God, I will not accept this anymore. Devil, you're going to loose your hand off of my city. You're going to loose your hand off of my family and those that I've been witnessing to. Devil, you will not hold them captive anymore. It's time for you to pay restitution. It's time for God to collect what belongs to my church. Again, you have to say it's unacceptable. Genesis 30, verse 1. Now Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children. Rachel envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children lest I die. That's where I was. So how do we fight the spirit? We judge it. We get dominion, but we must include God. We cannot do this without God. If you lack fruitfulness, ask God for it. And I know this sounds so basic. I'm sure every single person here has been like, I have asked God for it. But you need to base your life and your belief on God's word, not what the results are or have been. You see, Samuel used the sword to hack Agag into pieces, the scripture says. So biblically, the sword is the word of God. Hebrews 4.12, for the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and the joints of marrow and is the discerner of thoughts and the intents of the heart. You see, Samuel brought judgment with the sword. Revelation 19.15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword that with it he would strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the Almighty God. You see, the Word of God brings judgment to demonic forces and power. 
So what this actually boils down to for us is a deliverance from the lies, the demonic lies of barrenness. You see, we must silence the voice of barrenness. We must have a newfound perspective. And trust me, I get it. People get saved, they come in, they leave, and they never come back. I said, you know what? No, that's not acceptable. I'm not living with that anymore. So we must silence the voice of barrenness. First Samuel 15, 16, then Samuel said to Saul, this is after the fact, be quiet and I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. So here's Samuel dealing with Saul after this whole situation plays out. And Saul's probably trying to smooth his way out of it. And Samuel's saying, shut up. I'm not listening to you anymore. You listen to what God has to say. And this is what we have to do when there's a lie of barrenness and of doubt for your own church, for your own life. You say, you know what? Be quiet. I want to tell you what the Lord said to me last night. You have to take control and silence the lies of barrenness. Because when the curse of barrenness is broken, God's will will come to pass. Think about this. Fast forward, and then David is anointed as king. So now it goes from Saul just doing whatever, and I know David wasn't perfect, but then the status quo changed. The ruler changed. It was no longer this guy who was going to talk to witches and mediums. And so what needs to happen in our lives is now the status quo needs to change from barrenness to fruitfulness. You see, once you refuse to have peace with Agag, the, the breakthroughs will come. Matthew 13, 8, but others, others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some 100, some 60, and some 30-fold. You see, when we stand against barrenness, God gets involved. Why? Because he is the fruit bringer. He died so that people could be saved. I want you to know something. God loves people more than you and I. God wants to see revival more than we want to see revival. God wants to save people more than we did how he died for them. How do we know this? He died for them, right? And he is the fruit bringer. John 15, 4. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine and neither can you Bear fruit unless you remain in me. So think about this. We can make peace with this barren spirit, the spirit of Agag, this demonic stronghold. Or we could say, no, I'm getting a sword. It's time for you to die. We spent Halloween night, as I said, in the hospital going through one of the most difficult nights of our marriage. That was in 2018. In 2020, Ash and I were trick-or-treating just two weeks away from our first set of twins. Then, in 2022, we're trick-or-treating again with six princesses in a wagon. Like... And I mean, they were dressed up as princesses. They're not always princesses, right? I said, man, that's a picture of what God wants to do. That when you see God just multiply your life, it brings joy. It brings such a confidence in God. Listen to you. Listen to me. I'm telling you, I, I wish I had the picture. But when we took over the Santa Fe Church, it was about averaging from 25 to 40 people on a good Sunday morning. We, this was in March, and by March of this year, God just poured out his spirit. I, I pray this. I pray the same thing I told y'all that I pray, and I have an aggressive, I, I am pastoring offensively there. So I will accept nothing less than, and it's not just, it's not me. It's not like I'm, I'm yeah, I'm going to fight, but I said, God, I'm not dealing with this spirit. I'm not living with this spirit anymore. So from 25 to 40 on an average Sunday morning to now, our average has been anywhere from like 70 to 85, 90. We broke 100 on Easter in a year. (laughs) 
You can accept barrenness and make peace with it. Or you can stand against it and judge it. It's up to you. What you will live with and what you will say, it's time for you to die. I'm not going to live with you anymore. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed in this place tonight. We would like to invite you to join us in person at 18070 South Tamiami Trail, Unit 107. Our regular services are Sundays at 10.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. We also have midweek service at 7.30 p.m. For more information, please call 928-514-9527 or visit our website at www.pottershousefortmyers.com. We look forward to seeing you there soon.